And there we go. And today we have our good friend, Dan Fernandez, on a podcast. Uh, so welcome, Dan. Hey, glad to be here. This is exciting. How about we start with kind of a, a round of introductions? Uh, who you are, what do you do? Because we know you, our audience doesn't. Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, so my name's Dan Fernandez. Uh, I've been doing kind of developer focused stuff for, I don't know, probably like 20 years now in a variety of roles. So, um, while I recently joined Salesforce as their vice president of product for developer services, and that's everything from, uh, DevOps tools to our recently announced code builder tool, which is a partnership with Microsoft to do code spaces. Um, uh, uh, rebranded code builder and uh, specifically targeting Salesforce development. Um, I've been working on a number of things. So that includes like online experience for developers, which was kind of my previous role at Microsoft, reimagine our online dev experience, unify uh, the way we work with uh, technical audiences, reimagine learning online, um, uh, 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 and unifying and co authored our DevOps strategy. Um, uh, and all things in the middle and, and then other areas where, you know, worked on kind of core product management. So I was the third product manager for, uh, C sharp. Um, I was the lead product manager for visual studio express, uh, and wonderful pop fly, uh, the Azure SDK tool lead, uh, where we did a number of things from Azure SDK, Azure resource manager, uh, remote debugging. Docker tools, Visual Studio Code, uh, what was known as uh, Visual Studio Online and is now rebranded as Azure DevOps. Um, and, and then obviously some of the other areas which were like evangelism and advocacy, which is where I originally met Dan, where we started something called Coding for Fun, which was what are, you know, programming and uh, the technical field is more than just kind of what you do for your job. It's how can uh, how can there be an expression of code to do kind of fun, cool projects? So we got to do everything from uh, uh, build the Lego Mindstorms SDK to the official Connect SDK to um, uh, fun, cool projects, six foot tall boxing robots that uh, you know you punch, they punch. You know those sort of things. Uh, reality TV show where we did a concept car. Um, uh, um, uh, called the micro sting to uh, adding Visual Studio achievements. So as you do things in Visual Studio, uh, you know, it actually unlocks a uh, YouTube video downloader and all sorts of crazy projects. So um, uh, that's been, you know, uh, online developer experience, cloud developer tools and kind of developer evangelism and advocacy has been, been my life for a while. I like how humble you call it the, just a reality show when the reality was what West Coast customs like the Pimp My Ride. Oh wait, it wasn't Pimp My Ride. Was it? It Pimp was Ride? the same people from Pimp My Ride. Yes. They just decided to go independent for um, uh, uh, monetary reasons. They're right. in a contract where they kind of didn't own their destiny. So that's fantastic. I like that the humble just call out. I was like, that's just a reality show. <laughs> Don't worry about it's it. It's just kind of the random things that I can say that uh, the Troy McClure of uh, software development, if you will. So. So if the you're boxing familiar with the Simpsons, like the, the character that would just end up on the most random things. So, what was your pro what was your favorite thing that you worked on while you were doing coding for fun? Um, so I guess it depends on what the project is. One of the coolest was we got to go to Jim Henson's Muppets. Um, like if you're familiar with kind of the Muppets, we literally flew Clint Ruckus, Brian Peak, and I flew to uh, Los Angeles in one of the classic recording studios and actually got to see how Muppets, and they had a, a massive room where they did motion capture, which is to track the joints. And we built a prototype that's plugged into their system that instead of having a motion capture suit, which you've probably seen, like every single elbow and joint has a way to capture motion, uh, we did it with the Kinect. So it basically tracked the person and as you moved, so would uh, the character animation. So we did kind of these flowing motions with, where you move your arms and instead of kind of just like jittering, it would actually follow and, and have um, it's kind of like really flowing uh, bird-like movement, movements. And so uh, one, just hearing about kind of the history and seeing, you know, everything from 
uh, uh, the Oscars and, and awards that they've won for movies and TV shows was just kind of fascinating and getting kind of that behind the scenes tour and uh, understanding the work that they do, even just playing with puppets was, was fantastic where we got to use the, they use hand tools that are basically rigged up to send uh, messages over um, uh, uh, UDP to like uh, where where imagine like an, the equivalent of like five Xbox controller thumb controls that that manage the the ways uh, to do emotion. So each eye was its own thumb control. Each uh, eyebrow was, each mouth was. So you could kind of control these things, and you see the professionals do them. We got to play with it, um, and I have video somewhere. But that was just a thing where I was like, "Wow, this is this is." I can't believe I'm paid to do stuff like this. That's fantastic. How do you, you know? It seems like a very rich career where you've gotten to do all this fun stuff. How did you get into that? Because I mean, probably a lot of people listening hear that and think like, wow, I want to work on the exact same stuff. How do you break into that? Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it <laughs> is uh, uh, the, the, the right answer. So I think one is kind of breaking into how do you start a career when you don't kind of have a career? And I think that's the area where just kind of persistence and experience will help you. Um, and I say persistence and experience, and many times uh, uh, one of the best advice that uh, certainly I've gotten from other, uh, other folks and certainly I have for myself is don't just have a, a, a job where you have four years experience doing the same thing four years in a row. It's really one year of experience repeated four times. Really value and change what you're doing so that you're always constantly learning. Because the ability to learn is going to help you. Like if you've never built like something with electronics before, like build kind of like a real basic thing and then build something with audio programming, build something with video programming. Like the more you get experience and it's not to go uh, in any level of depth where you become the world's where you're going to be building the next premier elements. But when you get exposure to it, it really helps you kind of connect the dots with other technologies and integrate them together, right? So I, um, uh, just kind of one example, uh, uh, when we built the Coding for Fun book, I did a YouTube video downloader that that used, uh, um, you know, kind of hacked some of the ways that uh, YouTube was having videos and then used a tool called FFmpeg. I've now used FFmpeg. It's just like one app in, uh, that basically converts from, you know, item A into item B. I've used that tool. It's just another tool in my utility belt for all kinds of things from like editing friends events to, hey, somebody has this old flash video thing or, hey, I need a really nice still image at two minutes and 15 seconds of a video. Um, and, and or, hey, I need to convert, you know, everything in one folder from another folder. So the more you get experience going from, I have no experience in said domain and I'm gonna build something and doing that a lot actually gives you experience in, 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 uh, in learning things and being able to take up the next API. And I think that's always been helpful to me. And it also, also kind of just increases your confidence and experience on, hey, I'm gonna go in not knowing anything about connect programming. I don't even know what a connect is and I'm gonna be able to build something out of it and then make it rationalize how I should be able to use this and how a developer would be able to experience this. And you're, you're kind of getting a better understanding of the developer landscape too, because you're not kind of shoehorned into one maybe vertical, right? It's like developers are working on all sorts of products. And yes. so and if you don't, if you just kind of stay in your niche, right? I just want to focus on .NET. It's like, well, that's great and all, but there's people developing things for a myriad number, like toasters, right? Smart toasters and, you know, smart fridges and like all sorts of crazy stuff. So how would you ever, you know, you got to kind of broaden your, your horizon there. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the, what is it, a uh, 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 great artist steal, if you will. I think there's a lot of areas where you can be influenced by either other uh, product domains, other programming languages, or other approaches. Plus, you also end up seeing like, wow, okay, so everybody's doing this this way. This is how you kind of start off. When you see, like, say you're reviewing an API, it's like, why is our API doing something different? Like, literally, like the five different other companies that do this, do it this way, are we really being different to be different or is this a differentiated experience? 
And like the more like you can be like, hey, we're just trying to make things like this is what we'd call kind of a table stakes uh, uh, investment. Let's not rebuild or reinvent the wheel for this. Instead, let's just follow what other folks have done. So that way, if they are used to using something else, or if they've already built something for toasters, you know, the next application they add is going to be that much easier because, oh, it's really just like toasters plus plus, if yeah. you will. So, so absolutely. You know, I think Dan had a great kind of question there about like, okay, somebody is getting into the field. What would you consider your, you know, again, it's like, you don't know, but what would you consider your milestones in your career that have kind of shaped where you were like if you were to think of maybe the four or five things that have happened right that were landmarks right. for you um uh, so uh one is uh and maybe the broader kind of like if i had to give people uh, uh uh or maybe just almost like better message what i was saying earlier was uh there's a there's a theory called skill stacking where instead of you know being the one person that hey i'm going to study machine learning and get a you know 400 level and become a, a subject matter expert there there's actually value in being kind of the jack of all trades mm -hmm. right which is hey i'm going to know a little bit about marketing i'm going to know a little bit about business development i'm going to know a little bit about finance <clears throat> and similarly in technology roles like some front end experience some user experience some database uh, uh, design uh, ER diagrams and so on and so forth. And you gain that 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 uh, area where you kind of have that experience uh, gives you a better story. And I think that's uh, certainly been, if I had to think about what probably helped me uh, uh, get to where I have been, it's by having that kind of breadth of experience. So, um, uh, and this doesn't apply to just technical skills, um, uh, or something like finance, which is more like uh, um, uh, job skills, but also to the soft skills, which is um, there's great books uh, uh, on um, uh, pragmatic uh, writing, which is how do you write in a non-obtuse way? How do you make sure that your language is as approachable as possible, that, that it's super clear business uh, oriented writing? And if you become, you know, one of the things that we're certainly seeing in product management is people like drive clarity in what your messaging is. Yeah. If you can tell me something like, hey, we want to do this, we will become the best X for Y in three years. Like that's really clear. It's a vision that people can get excited about, but sometimes people can't get that and they kind of focus on the, well, the way we're going to do this is connect up, you know, the U, the U curved tube to the right side thing and they just get too yeah. washed in the details. So having those yep. soft skills really help. Uh, to give you one example, like uh, one one of the things that um, got me the job when I was uh, uh, at uh, Microsoft in DC, because I used to work in the field at Microsoft. So I wasn't out of corporate, I was responsible for sales, was I did a killer presentation at um, uh, uh, one of the .NET launch events. It was done. It was coming out in Visual. Uh, this is Visual Studio 2002. Just to completely date myself, and I did a, a, a killer app demo that had sync. You know, I made fun of Larry Ellison. You know, just the whole thing had the room roaring, and just by luck, there was a Visual Studio product manager named Ari Bixer, and that was in the room. Saw it and said, "I killed," and this person would be great. Uh, uh, to join the team. And uh, that led to me interviewing and getting the C Sharp product manager position. So it, it, it really like is. Helped. It was like a serendipity moment. Like you happen to be there and be talking passionately about something you knew about. Maybe right. you weren't a subject matter expert, but at least you were talking about it in a way that moved him, right? Yeah. And I think the key is rather than me focusing just on, let's say, looking at code or writing code. It was, hey, how do I like become a great presenter? How do I, uh, you know, and I, part of that, that process was I was going into accounts day in and day out and having uh, the real world experience of trying to convince people that were Java shops to uh, see the light of .NET. So um, you're literally practicing every day, just like an athlete. You're like you're going in there and you're having to practice that every day and probably there was, there was failure. I'm sure. Yeah, and you right. get to know kind of what works and what doesn't. And uh, that's one of those things where um, sometimes people go, well, I'm just not a good speaker. Nobody really is to begin with. I think you can find kind of like a good mentor to go with and really just start like the 
just start talking at user groups start talking at kind of smaller and then like you know you go from like local to like a regional event uh -huh. to you know kind of these national events and, and building up that building up that like confidence level right you you tackle the small things and hit those goals and then i also love that you brought up the fact that writing is so important again like for pms are clearly articulating articulating a vision even design and product design it's really important to be able to write well now because yeah you can make a great visual or like maybe a user story or a flow but you have to be able to still talk about it intelligently and like it needs to be tldr too like people don't right. have you know people don't have a lot of cycles they want to spend just focusing on reading a massive document and i think that kind of carries over into presentation skills as well you have to know like what's the thing you're going to say in 10 seconds that matters and shares a vision right and like gets people excited about what you're going to work on like, yeah, I the gets yeah. people excited is so ignored like uh, um, uh, in our industry. And there's just so much stuff where you'd be like, we're gonna be able to change the world, right? Uh, uh, and I used to say that when we were creating uh, Microsoft Learn, like this this really uh, uh, learning is one of the biggest uh, ways that you democratize. Uh, uh, it's like the uh, best way to, one of the best ways to democratize uh, uh, the learning curve and, and the ways for people to go from, certain socioeconomic statuses it's like education is the simplest and easiest way to do it you mm -hmm. do it for free you're really helping the world if you will and um, if you're uh, making it open source and you're allowing other people people to contribute it's like this knowledge of the crowds too like you're getting some of the best specialists in the world talking about this stuff or helping yeah. you improve your your documentation right yeah yeah and you know i think that was always funny there's kind of a natural tension on some of that stuff for like do we really want to be open source and uh, uh, it's kind of just funny. Last uh, uh, GitHub has a state of the Octoverse where they track the world's biggest open source projects and which uh, projects have the most contributors. Uh, Azure Docs was the number two largest open source project on GitHub. The only one that was larger was Visual Studio Code. That means there were more contributors to Azure Docs than Kubernetes, than Angular, than anything else, you, any cool acronym or hipster acronym you can name. <laughs> Azure Docs was number two. And I think the, the sad part was there was, a, 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 at least at some point, a movement to actually remove open source contributions from GitHub. And I was like, no, please don't do this. You're literally number two in the world. For you know, GitHub contribution. Is that, I mean, you probably have seen this thread and I've seen it through like user research sessions where people say they're actually intimidated to contribute. So you have this like, it's like, man, I would love to contribute to an open source project, but I don't know what to contribute to. I don't know how to get started because it's, it's so in depth, right? Like the, some of those open source projects are so rich and you have to have such a good context of where they're at in the workflow. Like, man, my contribution feels worthless or I don't even know where to start, right? Right. Um, but you got to remember, some of those contributions are nothing more than asking clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, uh, I noticed this article, like, does this work with Oracle 8i or not? Yes. Oh, you're right. It doesn't work with Oracle 8i. We need to say it, the minimum version is Oracle 11. Great. Can you write a PR uh, in the FAQ to say that it doesn't? You yeah. just saved the poor, poor person that had to write Oracle 8i like six hours of just painful frustration. Um, uh, before, the, you know, they solve themselves. So I think sometimes people assume like, hey, I have to write this, you know, Linux kernel before I can make a useful contribution, while an FAQ is a, a, a fantastic thing to have. Mm -hmm. Right. And you get the subject matter experts too, because somebody that works with your product day in and day out, they might know something that you totally have missed. And this is why after working on open source documentation, I think I can never unsee the true value of like open source docs. Where it's like, where's the, like, if I see a bug now, I'm like, where's the edit on GitHub button? I just, yes. I just want to fix this. <laughs> I need to like, fix this now. Yeah, like I don't, I don't want to like open some ticket and wait for people. Like I just look like I can, it's a typo. I can fix it or like a note, I can just add it. Um, Absolutely. So, to, to that, then I want to zero in on something that you called out earlier. Uh, and you mentioned when thinking about careers, oftentimes people get stuck in these roles where they get that kind of, you know, the same year four times instead of four years of experience. 
Right. What's your litmus test or like, how do you identify that you're in that position? Because I feel like I, that question gets asked of me sometimes when I talk to some of the folks that I mentor and it's kind of a, like, it's hard to know when do you know that that point is reached, right? Like what are the signs? Um, uh, I think that's a good question. And obviously um, uh, it like, I'm just trying to think about kind of from my personal experience, it's like if I notice a lot of the things that I'm doing, I'm not like having to either do either new research or like Google new things or like um, even kind of the the team has drifted off into incremental improvements that uh, aren't necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, have kind of the same level of impact as before. Those I think are, are areas where you go, cause you wanna have sometimes also the right balance where you still have some ways to learn. And are there ways, and I think the other way is even if you do feel that way, are there ways that you can almost like tilt or just change your job subtly so that you can learn? Hey, you know, uh, I, I do love my job, but I'm not necessarily like learning something new. In fact, I'm still bringing things that we had 18 months ago to market because we had a massive backlog. Well, great. Are there new practices that you can do to say validate said feature? Are there new ways that you can think about like, Hey, what's the revenue opportunity that maybe we aren't looking at this thing. So applying kind of new skills, like how would I uh, um, do uh, maybe uh, I, I had this feature in the backlog. We know we want it forever because we did customer development. What are the things that I can do to like apply data science or machine learning to make myself make the adopt understanding the adoption of this feature even better, right? So it's like, great, I'm gonna now put on my thing as my personal learning plan to learn uh, uh, um, uh, uh, better data or data analytics capabilities so that I can have a better understanding of how this project works. So even if you are kind of stuck, I still think there's ways to just kind of like are you really like learning in all the different facets where you can take this as an opportunity to learn a, a, a data-driven uh, planning or KPIs yeah. or um, those sort of things? So it, it really is on kind of you in some cases to do that. And in some cases you may find yourself like, okay, I really am just being asked, no, we're not gonna do any of that KPI stuff. Like, no, we're not gonna build, you know, a conversion funnel. No, I, you know, uh, uh, just, just do your thing, check your email. And, and that's where uh, um, you kind of realize. And I think the other part is you might find yourself kind of internally bored, right? Like, Hey, I'm, I'm checking Facebook or Reddit or whatever social network thing yeah. way much more than I want to. And it's part of me, you're, you're, whether you know it or not, part of your brain is already answering the question of, are you bored or not? You're a great person to talk about this because uh, you, if you look at your career at Microsoft, it was a long one. And it almost seems like you had to become somewhat of a renaissance man, like in your career bend, right? Like you're having to constantly morph within the company and move around of different projects that get you excited, right? You're, you're passionate about it. Like you said, you're looking for that, like, what's the next big thing I can help with? It's not like, I don't want to work on those incremental projects, you know, tiny little incremental improvements. It's like, am I still sitting at, hitting that same thread? Like that gets me excited. Right, right. You think in an organization, right? So or Microsoft is a huge org. Um, how did that shape out? Like, were you just basically connecting with other people in the org and saying, hey, I really am interested in your project. Like, how can I help out? And then you get pulled in or what was that? Yeah, I'm, I mean, there's some things where I think I've always uh, had a passion around kind of learning and education. Like, you can do a search for um, uh, Jacqueline Russell on archive.org. We had uh, um, a beginner developer learning center in like 2006, 2007 that had learning paths, right? Things that like we are, were relaunched again in what, 2018? <laughs> so, so in some cases, like having that old experience uh, uh, can kind of help or the, the, hey, we really need to do this and do this right in a way that's sustainable. Right. Um, uh, so I, I do think that um, uh, you can kind of almost like revisit ideas because sometimes they're not the right place for it. Or sometimes you don't have all of the tools that you're going to need to have that thing be able 
able to be sustainable. Like, hey, you know, we need to have this work in a way. If it's just, you know, one product manager working on this, it's never going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, the funny thing about the Beginner Developer Learning Center was it ended up being number two in MSDN Dev Center traffic for like the longest time. And we're like, please invest, please invest. And no one kind of wanted to. So you really have to be at kind of the, the right place in the right time where I've had many ideas that that folks have been like that. So, hey, we're just not ready to, or it's just not the right time, or there just isn't enough interest to do it. I think that yeah, part is so actually important. something that Din and I both like have ran into. It's like we have these like lofty visions of where the product can go, and people are like, wait, 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 we're not kind of ready for that. We're not ready to open up the floodgates on this. Or you share a vision, right? It's like we have the concept pitch. It's like a video game, right? You have the pitch for the story. You have the concept art. It's like we're ready. But they're like, yes. well, and, and there's cases in history that show us exactly that phenomenon. Like if you think of like tablets, right? Tablet PC, I don't know, Microsoft has brought it up in like 1998, 97 or something like that, like a long time before the iPad, but it never caught on. Like it just never became. And then the iPad came out with a price tag of, you know, $499, bam, like everyone now has an iPad. Right, so the, just the being at the right place at the right time and having it to a point where you just have to fit the market, you have to find the product market fit. Uh, but it, it's hard because sometimes you can, you know, uh, Google Glass, right? The same thing. Yeah. Uh, for fifteen hundred dollars, who wants to have those glasses? Like, oh, I don't know, well, maybe not. Ideas, ideas, you know, or like people say, ideas are cheap, and you know, you can even get them basically fully executed, and it still doesn't matter sometimes. <laughs> right. Bottom then, can because you hit it at the wrong time. The wrong exactly. Time. Yeah. And I think the like, other the other part sometimes is you'll find management that is more conservative. They don't want to take chances. You'd be like, hey, look, we think we have a chance to, you know, build another $100 million business to do X, Y, or Z. And they'll be like, no, stay, stay in your box, stay in your lane. And I think that's that can be really frustrating for folks who are like, wow, we have this big vision and we just talked to these other two folks and the customers validated this and it's all like, go, go, go. And you, you find that where folks uh, uh, um, just almost will say no either by default or don't have the, the, the courage or the audacity to think big enough. And I think that's always been like one area that, that's been kind of a, a frustration. Uh, but part of that is kind of selling folks over. There was a, a, a book I was reading just recently um, called Call Sign Chaos. And it was uh, um, by James Mattis, who is uh, uh, talking about like he led the invasion into Baghdad and like literally while there's like just a couple miles outside of Baghdad, he's been told by his superiors to stop. He's I, like, are, I you, are you, yeah, yes, I know that are you kidding me? Like, we're going to get shelled here. I can't even protect these people. And like now this has to go back like I can take over this city right now. We can stop all of all of these issues right now before they happen. And it's like, well, we got to go talk to upper management, just sit tight. And it's just like, you know, in some cases, you know, I joke is like, oh, just this is so painful. I can't believe like we're even questioning this great idea like, you know, that, that could be done with minimal effort or, you know, this partnership or whatever it is. Uh, uh, in in kind of a non life or death situation. Yeah, and you get into that. Yeah, you get into that complacent that place of complacency. It's like, why would I want to be on a team that's just complacent to optimize an existing funnel? You know, when we could take these big steps forward. Right. Let's, let's do some big risk, especially if you're at a big company, right? Like, if you're at a big company, you, I feel like you have a deep pocket and you have a lot more resistance to. The inertia, right? The organizational, yeah, like, like when you, uh, there's this yes. book that I've read, the uh, Innovator's Dilemma, right? Where they brought up the examples of back in the day, like hard disks, right? When the new smaller hard disks were coming out, the companies that were the best position to produce them would refuse to innovate because they're like, well, we have the stock of hard disks that we need to sell of a certain <laughs> format. It doesn't make sense to sabotage ourselves and create a new business line that's going to then make us lose the stock. So they would be kind of force themselves to stick with this old old technology while others more nimble companies just like go 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 and they got taken over it was like kodak right. i think with digital cameras the same way yeah, right it's like yeah. where they was like there's digital cameras emerging They're like no 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 we have all this film to sell 
there is like that's going to sabotage our own stock why would we innovate but and that was their undoing yeah uh, uh, there are unfortunately way too many examples uh, of that kind of in the industry or what people not even realizing what their real industry is. We're like, oh, no, we're the print photography person. Like, no, you should be the photography thing or just like stepping back and think about what what the more holistic view is and and yeah, moments right or like we are an experience company. I think that's what Apple does a really good job of. Right. They like sell you on emotion. They're not selling you a piece of a glass hardware right, right. They're selling you like we're cool and like when you use our products they're really easy to use and like kind of sexy and like they're awesome right like you feel good using them so they're yeah, selling they just great work like a, like i said a phone like you know somebody can go get a, a google phone and but this is to dan's it. original point right of like they communicate that really well because imagine they came out as like we brought the new communicator device that enables your business productivity and you can get email faster. It's like th that would not resonate versus like you see the earlier like Steve Jobs presentation where, you know, here's a phone, doesn't have any apps. It has like the calculator, but you love this. And you kind of see that experience and that polish and you're like, yeah, this this resonates with me. But I can imagine just how much research they've put into crafting like the exact wording, the exact presentation of that, you know, five minutes of however long that iPhone is presented on stage. Yeah. Absolutely. They, they, the, they care about all the details. Um, and it shows now, Dan, like tying this back to, again, you're focused on developer experience and it sounds like you, you know, you've been doing developer experience for a long time. So there is emotion with being a developer and like designing and building products for developers and looking at something like Azure, right? Azure SDK, like, how do you put emotion into that? Like, how do you make that exciting and like fun for developers to do their job? Like what was kind of your, you know, like what did you keep in the back of your mind? Like, I want to make this a good experience for people. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I think the, the things that we talked about um, and some of those, some of those became reality, some of them didn't. Um, but like, uh, uh, how do I make everything that I'm so used to on my local experience just work in the cloud? So uh, for uh, one of the things, and I don't think this ever shipped, was F5 to the cloud. Imagine like today, if you're a web developer, what you basically do is do a save and refresh, mm -hmm. right? What if that was your experience, but instead of refresh to you know local host, it's refreshing to the cloud, like instant app de deployment. You don't have to worry about it, and everything you're doing is kind of in the cloud. Um, uh, and depending on who you talk to, they either thought that was uh, like fantastic or wow, we should totally do that and it's really exciting. Or like, hey, this is a toy, you know, I'm not going to really use this. And it really depended on what their previous mental model was. Yeah. Anybody that was kind of using like web development and, and kind of uh, say it was uh, Express or Node.js or any of these tools that in many cases would basically look at your app and then automatically update it on a save on refresh or they're uh, watching like right? watchers. Watching. Yeah. So, um, uh, they were like, that's exactly what you're doing. It's if you're cloud enabling that, that duh, that makes a total uh, amount of sense and not have to worry about another deployment or this weird kind of separate thing. And I'm also now validating it actually works in the cloud, right? So that whole, it works on my machine, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just works. So, um, uh, and then I think there were other examples that, that kind of fell into um, that realm, but uh, 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 as kind of one example, the Docker tooling, right? That was also the premise of, it just works on my, it works on my machine. I can now test drive any piece of software that anybody's built without having it touch my machine. Like, I don't want to install your software. I don't want to install, like, that's, that's really scary. Let me do this thing, run with simple script, and I can now test drive any piece of software uh, of any type. And, and same thing, I can also easily deploy my, my friend's software and not have to you know, uh, install it or spend an hour configuring it. It's, it's just that easy. And I think there was a lot of kind of love and interest for developers uh, on the Docker side. And then some of the other parts is like, how do you make this fun? Like one of the biggest challenges we had was, hey, we did PowerShell scripting to automate things. Uh, so, and like, how do you make it that exciting, 
right? And I, and I kid you not, I did this for uh, 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 the VP, uh, Julia Louisen of uh, DevDiv, which is, hey, it's so easy uh, uh, to make deployments that I built a Clapper app. So back to some of my audio programming. <laughs> um, uh, there was a coding for fun uh, uh, developer whose name is now escaping me. And, and of course, I'll remember it that had done uh, the Skype voice changer. Uh, um, he had done an, uh, a fantastic audio. So I literally used his audio library. It's an audio library. And again, uh, I probably just need to look. The person in audio. Was it, see, Mark Heath? Yes. So uh, there was a, a, you guys can edit this part. Uh, Mark Heath had built a library called N Audio and had examples that showed when uh, uh, audio gets certain, like basically uh, uh, on the high clip, I use that N Audio library to listen to a clap. And that clap actually started running the PowerShell and did a deploy. And I was like, it's that easy. You just double <laughs> clap and you deploy your application. And the funniest, and they were like, everybody was like laughing in the room and it just showed like, hey, this is this is the power of extensibility of PowerShell and everything else. The uh, There was a tester in the room who did this. <laughs> and all of a sudden three more deployments went through. <laughs> And uh, it was just hilarious because the tester was like, this is clearly done by a developer and not by a tester that, that you know, <laughs> didn't isolate and said there can only be one deployment at, at a time. But what a great story. Like what a way to change like a, a rather dry subject into something that's like compelling and like kind of illustrates the point of here's how you can use this technology and have fun with it. Like, Yeah, and the point was, hey, there's a million ways you can do this. Maybe your push button, maybe you want to use PowerShell make it into a clapper and so on. And then like send it back, you know, uh, there's other folks that did things like, you know, bunnies that would, eyes would glow when the deployment worked and <laughs> things like that. So you, you again, kind of make it more interesting uh, um, uh, from that example. You can literally I think I ended have, up using that for a tech ed talk. Right, you can literally have a big red button for like production deploys. Yes. Oh, uh, I actually kept uh, the bad logic in where I didn't uh, uh, isolate um, that. Uh, so when I did the clap, the applicant, everybody, the audience started seeing the deployment. And what I didn't expect, they started clapping. So it's launched <laughs> another one as well. So that's that's somewhere in some Channel 9 archive is uh, uh, the multi-deployment PowerShell. But great. Now you have to pay for was like 7,000 concurrent builds. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> And I think some of the other stuff, the, the section has just worked. Uh, uh, two other examples, Visual Studio Code. R remember, we were a Windows company. So now you're running C Sharp. It's in Linux. You're, and you can literally run from breakpoint to breakpoint inside of a Linux Docker. Uh, uh, and like people just were like, wow, I, that's like a mic dropping moment. I can now like work. Uh, across language, across operating system, and I still get all the tools and, and things that I love, which is like a rich debugging experience uh, or remote debugging, which allowed me to actually connect up to a remote machine uh, like in Asia and step into code one by, line by line. And in one of the lines, we actually had C-sharp code call into C++ code. And all of a sudden, like, like uh, Inception, it started debugging inside the C++ code. Um, and that one was to use, you know, one of those Instagram effects that uh -huh. takes a nice image or whatever. And that was in another Azure SDK talk. But people love the fact that, like, you get all that capability, even though you're going to the cloud, the things you love, you know, uh, stepping through code, stepping in from one language to another just worked. So I find it interesting that actually, like, to the topic of the projects that you built on, I see a trend of there's a lot of this literally coding for fun, literally building stuff for the sake of building. And I think a lot of you know developers, a lot of engineers, when you talk to them, they're like, oh, I want to build the next business, the next product, the next kind of... Um, and I, I see that you find a lot of value in building for the sake of building, like just fun stuff. What's your philosophy on that? Like, how, like I think it goes important? back to that hearts and minds, right? Which is like, hey, I can give you a data sheet that says, um, hey, here's the, the 10 technical reasons. And you always want that stuff. Uh, like, we are Sarbanes-Oxley compliant. Okay, that, that's great. Like, yes, I need to 
click that checkbox and that's fantastic. But like, you know, if you can be like an experience, you know, love building apps for your cloud, like making that an emotional experience and connecting yourself, I think is, is really one of the keys that drives people to go kind of um, not just like to be users, but to be fans of your software, to be have that emotional response, to have that uh, connectivity with either other folks on your team, to put yourself out there and be like, hey, like the, the Avis we try harder back from like, hey, this is our team's philosophy. We're gonna go above and beyond to try and do the right thing to making our products fun and easy to use and a consistent so like, hey, wow, I, it was so easy for me to pick up, uh, you know, block C because I had already learned how to do A and B. Hearts and minds. It's the simple things. It, it's definitely something that's not common because I feel like oftentimes, both from the product side and engineering side, we get so into kind of the details of the product where you get so ingrained into essentially thinking of like, oh, I need to change the color, oh, I need to change the layout, right? Like, instead of thinking of this holistic experience, like, what is that I'm making for the user? How do you, in your career, in your kind of past experiences, transition between these two modes of operation? Because you have to be both kind of thinking big and what you're describing of like hearts and minds, where I want to get people excited, I want to understand what, how to position my product, and also the details, because you need to be focused on the details to make this whole experience work. How do you zoom in and out of these two kind of modes of operation. Yeah, I think there is, uh, uh, there's a book on this. I think it's called like Thinking Big and Small. <laughs> that literally probably gives, you know, the, the 400 page answer to, uh, uh, to this. But I think having kind of the, what's our big audacious goals and how do we think big about like really changing something huge? You know, when we built, uh, uh, thought about like what uh, we ended up calling the new hope, if you will. Uh, which was the code name uh, named after Star Wars for how we were going to unify our web experience for documentation, where we had like 30 plus different websites. Um, uh, part of that was um, uh, uh, really having people feel or understand the pain and friction that customers go through. You want to build a web app with data and identity like uh, that you log into? Great, that's spread across six different websites today. Azure ASP.NET Entity Framework, uh, uh, Azure AAD, and SQL Server. And SQL Server technically is spread across two different sites because depending on which features of SQL Server you use, they were either on um, uh, uh, our IT website or on MSDN. So uh, it was just kind of like, wow, is that really the friction we we want? Probably very um, very few shared experiences too, right? Like they're unique one-offs. Absolutely. Just to give you an example, great. Uh, uh, what was it? Let's just say like, I don't know, 50% of our business comes from more than 50% of our business comes from outside the US. Well, the vast majority of those different websites weren't localized. Oops. <laughs> hey, let's make sure to, to uh, just exclude a, a huge addressable market. Um, or we ended up duplicating ourselves. So really thinking about like, what are the, the pains that we have? Maybe it's duplication, maybe it's consistency and experience. Maybe it's the fact that, you know, you jumped off into a cliff and there's no, uh, like we give you the Lego, we show you, here's a stack of bricks and here's cement. And I sure hope you can build a house as opposed to showing people, hey, here's the blueprints for how to build a house, how to build plumbing and so on and so forth. So Dan, you said, you know, early on in the interview, we talked about how you were a sales guy to start with. And I like that because as a salesperson, you have to be close to your customers and understand them deeply and then like know how to monitor like what's good feedback and what's not, right? Like what can I act on and what not? So I wasn't a salesperson to be fair. Uh, uh, I was a developer evangelist. So I had three products that I was selling. Uh, 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 evangelizing. Uh, Yes, exactly. Um, uh, but uh, luckily, so I didn't have a quota. That field, that field commentary, right? Like on using the product, and you're the clo you're really close to the people actually using the yes. technology. Yes, and absolutely. So you mentioned that you looked at, you know, for documentation, you had this example of this was a really splintered experience. Well, how did you talk about that to your team, right? Like, how did you showcase that? Did you 
did you do like ride alongs with people and then just kind of record them or like what how did you i guess kind of elevate yeah that? so one the way we kind of framed it was just showing a customer experience and showing how they had to go to five different websites and then it's like hey this is just one like do we think a website with data that you sign in is a common scenario yes well this is what it is six different websites and then it's like, well, let's show all the interconnections. And you just see these islands of, of websites going through. And it's like, wow, is that is that really what customers go through? And uh, another great example is to do like a deck that just shows the friction. Like, okay, I try and sign on this, but guess what? It doesn't take my identity. So I have to go over to this site to go to this identity. But it turns out I can't use a GitHub account if it's built in here. <laughs> Great. So then I go in and, and there's some special offer and I want to basically validate the student offer. Well, our, uh, I give you another real world example. Our Visual Studio tools used to not work with student accounts. So people would think it's like, hey, your system sucks. I tried to do this in my a university and it's because a student account was a different account and literally the systems didn't work together. So what a, what a so, turn off for a young programmer, right? Like or developer. It's like, wow, I don't want to use Microsoft tech. <laughs> right. You you just want to kick the tires. You go through step by step in the instructions. It doesn't work. There's no guidance. The screenshots look identical. You would have never known that that literally the way your account was built was this friction. So so I think that's the how do you get people to kind of understand that friction and that pain and yeah. even show them uh, verbatim quotes. So we had a number of folks who gave us verbatim quotes and uh, like a couple of them we ended up hiring like John Pop <laughs> and, and others. So powerful. They're so powerful for conversing with your team. I love them. I think they're they're amazing. Yes. And, and it really helped kind of, uh, um, uh, I guess, get people to understand kind of the goals. And I, I think this is another area that we talked about, like making sure you understand what business you're in. Um, when we were talking earlier, like, hey, like what, what business was Kodak in, if you will? I do think like if you build the product and if you could build it in the right way, uh, uh, one of the challenges we had is people kept saying traffic is the way we're going to measure success on documentation. If you build products in the right way, maybe you never need to look at document. Maybe our documentation traffic goes to zero. Yeah. And that's, that's so great because no customer needed to Google our products to get started. And, and that's you write a blog post about that. <laughs> oh, oh did you? Vanity metrics, vanity, vanity metrics. That's yeah. what it is. That's oh, a, yes. the, the focus on of just saying like, oh, we have half a million page views. We did awesome. Did you though? I don't know. That that seems odd. Yeah, I, the 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 key takeaway is your goal is to drive adoption of those other products. If the Azure products were so easy to build applications on, maybe you never needed that extra help in the documentation to get you there. Like the goal is that a customer can be successful on the platform, not that they went and, you know, completed learning modules or documentation. So it's always like a challenge to make sure that you have kind of your right mindset on what that uh, 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 goal really should be. Yeah. And which is very hard because it's very easy to get kind of sidetracked and understand, you know, uh, you see your traffic numbers go up and that looks exciting, right? Like people are going to your page and, uh, you can just stop right there and say we're good. You know, we get a lot of traffic. That's that, that success. But in reality, if none of that translates to dollars, like, well, what's the point? Right. Or, or there's some other way for in I don't know uh, integration in the portal that ends up like helping helping people or some you know uh, teams bot that ends up like being your, your application assistant and that bot ends up being in Visual Studio Code and you never end up going to a URL. Like that's like the point is the outcome you're trying to drive is success and adoption of the platform. Um, the fact that, you know, people are, have found a more efficient way to do that, switching from say, um, you know, uh, 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 analog cameras to digital cameras doesn't matter. They're now more successful in the the job that they're trying to do. Right. And to that extent, you're talking about a lot of these skills and like knowing different languages and technologies. How do you learn? What's your approach to just learning things that you need to learn? 
So I take a lot of um, uh, online courses or tutorials and I literally have a backlog of stuff that I wanted to do. Um, but the, uh, uh, the other area that I do is try and pick on projects where I have an excuse to kind of learn something new. It's like, okay, you know what I really want to do is, you know, X, Y, Z. And there's a, a ton of these, like I have, you know, my personal backlog of app ideas that I want to do, or just to play with different technologies uh, uh, there. And I use that as an excuse. Oh, that thing's going to be React because I want to use React, if you will. So, um, but I think it's just figuring out what you want to do in terms of the, hey, this I might need this for work, or I'm really interested in this and just kind of building the right, um, I don't know, a, a level set. And then like, again, I, I, the, the number one thing, and I, I've certainly said this for learn is you learn by doing right. So you can watch some YouTube video and never, you know, write your first thing, but that's not going to be helpful. You really need to learn by doing and not just follow the tutorial, but like just try and change things on your own. And that gives you kind of the experience of, of you know, having that coding experience, uh, uh, taking in a new library and doing X, Y, Z with it. I, I think we're also seeing this shift actually in online learning, like being close to learn Microsoft Learn right now myself and kind of working on this, where we're seeing it move from like passive learning to active learning. So we're seeing services like Twitch and we're seeing learning mm -hmm. environments that are interactive. So like we have a code editor, like literally built in line with like our learn modules, right? And stuff. So you're getting this, yeah, again, you don't, you're not sitting back and just taking a, a YouTube video um, and just listening right. to it. You're actually invigorated and kind of participating in it. Like I know that for me, Twitch sessions, when I watch somebody designing on Twitch, like it gets me excited. Like live sessions are exciting and I can talk with the, the designer maybe and, and kind of hear their thoughts or, you know, again, just kind of going through a tutorial and actually being able to hash it out in the console right there next to the documentation I'm working on. So I think we're going to see this world of like moving you know, it's going to, there's still going to be passive learning elements, but you're going to start seeing that interactivity sprinkled in. And then we're probably going to end up like on some homogenous executions of that, right? Like if it's document, if it's programming material, maybe there's inline programming environments that are in the cloud, right? And you don't have to spin it up on your machine. I think you were talking about this earlier. Like it just works right there next to the Correct. tutorial you're doing, right? You don't yeah. have to fire anything on your local machine. You don't have to install freaking Ruby and a bunch of gems and stuff like, you know, like it's just, it's there, it's done. Yeah, so, so you can focus, uh, um, there's this great quote uh, 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 or great reuse by a company called Launch Darkly on uh, essential complexity versus accidental complexity. Essential complexity is like, this is what I'm really trying to do. This is the business logic, the core of what I wanna do. Accidental complexity is everything around it, which is, geez, I wanna make a change, but now I need to, update my web pack, but I have a dependency on this thing, but it's using grunt. So, uh, uh, and this project uses gulp and I need to unify all these. So I'm going to call an extra and it's just these like, uh, uh, I don't, it's like, I don't care about gulp right now. Like I'm literally just trying to learn this thing. In this. I, I think, yeah, that, that yeah, so you spend so much time on the not <laughs> everything besides the actual code you're trying to do. I think that's the fault where a lot of times these new tools that are being created, there is a heavy focus on the tool itself where it's like, oh, we have this new framework, you know, stackify everything.css. And you're and it has this option and this option and this option. But then you forget that 90% of your people will never touch those options. But for the common case, you now overcomplexify the scenario so much. Where for me to create like a yeah. You know, like a PWA, like just a progressive web app, a one page app, I need to do these like 17 incantations, configurations and webpack and gulp and like, why? Why not? Just, I just need an HTML file. Like <laughs> This is it. Yes. Um, and I think that's, that's probably another kind of tension, which is um, when you're de designing a developer experience, do I, how do I choose what to do? Like just, let's just pick on web development because uh, uh, it's it's wonderfully complex. Do I pick my experience and then do a, a sample in all the popular JavaScript frameworks? Do I then choose like, do I do all of that also in TypeScript? Like like the the matrix of things for how, how many things you wanna do or do I just kind of focus on the real basics? 
um, is a challenge. And I think it really obviously depends on how much or, or what type of your application, uh, what type of application you're building and what experience you want. Like if it's very UX driven, then you probably do want to have it be as reusable, reusable as possible. And I think that's always a challenge, which is there's, you know, the trendiness web components is now kind of taking off and there's preact, which is, you know, the lightweight react. At what point do you make the decisions to, am I going to support this versus that? And I think that's always just like a, 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 a challenge for folks as well. And that's until you try it. And then you, you know, it, six months into your dev cycle, realize that there's no Stripe plugin for whatever framework you chose. So now you have to rewrite the whole thing just to enable Stripe. Keep inventing all this stuff that saves us time and then we have less time. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I think that's uh, that's another area. It's like that complexity versus simplicity thing. Um, uh, in many cases, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna take a bunch of upfront complexity to get simplicity in the end. Yeah. Right. So we're, we're actually getting a time. So Dan, where can people find you? What's the best way to reach you? Uh, probably at, uh, on uh, our dear friend, uh, the Twitters. Um, <laughs> hey, Dan, wasn't there a time in your life when you were a blonde? Uh, yes. I, I, uh, I, I stumbled upon a blog post that had, a, it was, it was actually, I stumbled upon this at work because I was going through archived content on the MSDN blog, tech blog. Oh, right? no way. And there's oh, a photo cool. of you. Yes, it's amazing. And it said blondes have more fun or something like that. <laughs> uh, which is probably accurate. Ac absolutely. So um, uh, uh, I- How sweet. long has it been since you've been a blonde? Are you going to go back to being blonde someday? <laughs> um, I thought about it. And then I was like, wow, I'm just going to be this old man that still has like blonde hair and and- <laughs> But then again, like at some point you also just don't give a crap. So there's, there's that really like, just be happy with yourself. And, um, uh, uh, there's probably a whole other podcast to do. on like, when you reach that level of success where, where you no longer have to like worry about a certain level of things, it's, you do not care. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and you certainly see it, uh, from some folks. From, from that perspective. I, I just sure. love that I stumbled upon that though. I was like kind of doing some research and I was like, wow, this is an awesome post. Just a short little post. Oh, I'll, I'll have to what find that. Think? And then it has a picture of both of your, your brunette and your blonde version, so. Oh, that's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, if I remember one thing, it was I felt more guilty when I wasn't working out with blonde hair. It was like that whole like, all right, if I'm trying to be conscious on hair, but yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 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 be yourself is the other thing. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. So the yeah, Twitters, yeah. but the Twitters, which Twitters? We oh, sorry. Uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter.com slash Daniel F.E. F like Frank, E like Edwards. And uh, we should be watching the Twitters for a launch that's coming soon. Yes. A fun so, project. Uh, 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 what a great and totally not obvious lead in, Dan to uh, uh, Project Den and I have been working on called Meeting Shot. So um, uh, as with all good ideas, it started by buying a URL first then actually never doing anything with it, meetingshot.com. <laughs> but uh, it's basically, uh, uh, what do we call it? The fear of missing meetings, I think was the uh, yeah. FOMO. Um, uh, and the F-O-M-M-O, -O -O, fear of missing meetings online. And the idea is uh, much like you see people post Zoom screenshots of like, oh yes, we're meeting with this person, that person. Now you can actually build your own. It has uh, some cool screen capture things. So you can actually plug in, get the real time capture. Thank you, Den, for that. Um, or plug in your picture. So you can be like, yeah, you know, I, I was on a Zoom meeting with uh, Barack Obama and you can add <laughs> Boris Johnson or whomever else you want and then share the picture online. So. It should be kind of a fun thing. Um, uh, and back to excuses to learn, I wanted to learn CSS Grid. So I was like, okay, I'll use this as, as an excuse to, to learn CSS Grid. This is uh, so watch out for meetingshot.com, our faux meeting screenshot generator. Um, I'm excited to finally be in a meeting with the cast of The Office. Uh, it's been a long <laughs> time coming. And uh, finally, I can realize my dream. Yes. Uh, on the show next time. <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly. Well, this has been fantastic. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming over. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks, folks. Have a good Thanks. one.